Welcome back to Night School, the or episode 25, the poems of Emily Dickinson, part three. And back with me is my esteemed colleague, Mr. West Chance. Welcome back, Mr. West Chance. Good to be here. How's it going? It's going really well. We are uh, uh, getting our last day of lecture in tomorrow for the Purgatorio and the Odyssey class. And so uh, those listeners who listen also to the classic works that I put out there, um, I'm finishing the Purgatorio course, if you've been following that tomorrow. And you know, that's a pretty big achievement. And you were, you were riding me pretty hard to get that on. And I know it's not what you asked me for, uh, Wes, because the Inferno is not up there yet. But uh, I think that's a good step forward. It's really, I think it's really cool that you've got, you know, a course that you're teaching and you go ahead and record it as you do it. And you're sort of killing two birds with one stone there. I mean, there's, there's no better way than to capture it live and, and in the moment. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, and I think that if I ever do have critics and detractors, if we det- if we attract those, um, it'll be a good way for them to see what I'm actually about when they want to criticize me. And I think it will make people who just take one piece of my work and try and really make a you know an argument against me that's potentially a red herring or wrong. Well, it'll make them look pretty silly. And also, I think it just holds me to a higher standard. Everybody could be listening to what I have to say to these students. Everybody can be judging it. And so, you know, I, it's, it's as if God is present in my classroom and I better get it right. Um, so, you know, it, it makes me take it very seriously. It makes the students take it very seriously too. They understand that I'm, I'm doing this for them and for those of them who are not there and for their children. Well, I mean, that's a really practical tool right there for any teachers listening. Like, maybe just pitch that idea to your students. Like what if we like actually record ourselves and then we can like listen to ourselves later and see, you know, what went well and what didn't. And we can, we can tinker with that and improve upon it and, you know, admire the things that we did well and learn from the things we didn't. I think that's a really cool idea. Yeah. And look back on it, not only in the immediate future, but in the more distant future when you have perhaps less embarrassment or, or biases keeping you from seeing what's there and thus more appreciation for how far you've grown, ideally how far you've grown. I, I just think, I think recording is so valuable in so many different endeavors for that reason, because you have objective proof of what is there. And so you don't hide from what you see and it helps you to actually correct what you don't like when you see it. And, you know, in CrossFit, when I was doing Olympic lifts very poorly, uh, we would use Coach's Eye, which was a program, which would take a, a video of us and then we could uh, draw on the screen and also um, – go into slow-mo but the thing is like it was much more effective than just any coach telling me anything like I would see my flaws and then seeing or hearing them as I do here it just it gives me a much bigger incentive through self-disgust to to fix what's there and approach the form a little more yeah that's fair. yeah to take what's subjective and be able to stand back and see it a little bit objectively is always a useful well and then the to go the, the other route too, right? And sort of get, see things from, from within as much as possible, put yourself in their shoes. Like that's just, just as powerful in poetry. Just to segue a little bit here, like poetry and literature and art are all awesome ways of, of doing, I, I think both those things actually. That, that seems to be the very idea of Dante's Purgatorio. And that seems to be why art is present, which my students recently wrote on. And that in, in fact, he, he says the point of all these representative stories he watched is so that he could, like you said, stand beside himself and see those truths, which he could not deny about that, which was not independent from him, his sin, his errors. They were just all too obvious when he looked at all the exemplars of sin and story that he sees going up the purgatory. And that I think is the point of art. How is this relevant to you? Why are we sharing this story with you? We're teaching you something. So with that said, shall we on to All Overgrown by Cunning Moss, which yeah. is wedged between a paragraph talking about some of uh, Dickinson's uh, American influences in her, her library, Longfellow, Thoreau, Hawthorne, Emerson, also some English romantics, George Eliot and the Bronte sisters and the Brownings, all of whom I would love to read with you. And yeah. then we also see that she had quite the affinity for Charlotte Bronte commemorating her deaths. She, of course, wrote the, the very famous uh, Jane Eyre, which I was forced to read in high school and probably didn't give a fair shake to, would read again. And oh, Emily Bronte, writer of Wuthering Heights, her sister, 
which I've also not taken a crack at. That'd be that'd be major work, Wes. I we might need a third rower if we were going to get through something like Bronte and maybe maybe add in um, Middle March as well, and maybe Pride and Prejudice just to throw them into the equation. Well, yeah. There's I mean those are some books that are beloved by many readers. Like I also uh, have tried reading those, um, but not recently. Uh, and they're, they're really amazing. And there's just a wealth uh, of stuff out there. So yeah, yeah, we, we should, but let's go. Okay. Let's go into uh, all overgrown by Connie Moss. All right. Is it, is it you or me? Um, I think this is an odd one. If I'm remembering right. All right. And you're the odd one. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, here goes. All overgrown by cunning moss, all interspersed with weed, the little cage of Kerr Bell and quiet Howarth laid. This bird, observing others when frosts too sharp became, retire to other latitudes, quietly did the same, but differed in returning, since Yorkshire hills are green, yet not in all the nests I meet can nightingale be seen. All right. Well, th in this poem, particularly, I wish um, that I had the time to look up this uh, expression "cur bell" and see what that meant. Uh, Quiet Haworth laid seems to be a place rather than a person, but I'd like to know that too. And then these Yorkshire hill hills are these, you know, America? She's talking about Yor Yorkshire, or is it England? Because that's certainly an English word, but we've adopted many of those. New York, for example. And the nightingale, is this the same as the uh, this bird? And I, I am aware that there are some, I, I, I think, negative and sad mythological connotations that go along with the nightingale. I think the story, there's an Eastern story of how the nightingale becomes a nightingale, and it is a story of imprisonment, if I recall correctly. But I, I wish I could look that up very quickly, too, and perhaps I will. But I, I'm left with a lot of questions. <laughs> that said, let's articulate a little bit of this. So we have uh, some anaphora at the beginning of this poetry, uh, just structurally speaking, because we've talked about her structure. There are three stanzas here. Each is a quatrain. Each seems to be very similar in um, length of line with the first lines often long, not too long. We have also her, her uses of the, uh, the dash again, and often at least after the first stanza in the final two, well, we have zero, two, then four, so they sort of multiply exponentially. Um, uh, let's see, we have all followed by all in the first two lines, and it's an image of overgrown by cunning moss, one of sort of uh, decadence of a statue covered by moss, so something that is past its peak, not kept up with in some way, and interspersed with weed, that's the same idea, something that is overgrown in some way, uh, there is a lack of art present and too much nature coming through that is hurting the form or the structure or the order of a place. Uh, the little cage of Kerr Bell, I, I need to know what Kerr Bell means, is that, um, it's, um, yeah. It looks, like it's the, it looks like it's the pen name of Charlotte Bronte. Ah, uh, see, okay, that makes perfect sense in context. Then, okay, so the little cage in which she found herself, potentially just hypothesis, uh, the sort of, uh, and just having read the Emily 101 uh, essay from which we derive these texts from, um, I, I know that she herself, uh, or at least the idea behind her is that she found herself at times constrained by the society in which she found herself as a woman in Victorian uh, America. And she seems to be finding, or potentially she is finding my hypothesis is, is some solidarity here with a Bronte sister who also found herself in English society, I believe. Um, were the Brontes English or American? I, I, it's sad that I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Know they're, Jane, yeah. They're English. They're on the... That's what and, I thought. That's what Howarth, I thought. It looks like Haworth is their, um, the, the place that they live. Okay, in England, yeah. the little cage of Charlotte Bronte and Quiet Haworth. And so she seems to be uh, developing some solidarity here with the idea that these women were so much more than their society and their surroundings and the role of a woman at that time. And so it's too small a cage, too small a pond for the koi. Um, uh, and so she, this is a woman who is too big for her place and time. And potentially Emily Dickinson 
feels the same. This bird, um, which is both a, both a compliment and an insult at the same time. Uh, there's the connotation of rare bird, sort of weird, strange, but also of somebody with a higher perspective potentially and a uniqueness on the positive side. Um, observing others when frost too sharp became retire to other latitudes. So when frost too sharp became, it, it almost sounds like Charlotte Bronte committed suicide from this, that when thing, the pain of life became too much, she decided to retire to the, the white isles, to other latitudes. That's an expression, a mythological pre expression for places we do not know, the unknown, the great unknown, death. Um, uh, purgatory is in a hemisphere we did not know about for Dante and, um, and, uh, the white isle or hyperborea for the Greeks are those lands that are beyond the known. And so that, that's essentially what heaven is a more abstract version of any place that is beyond that is better than this place towards which we can strive. And so that's why Jerusalem was that in the old Testament, because it's a physical manifestation. And that's the Roman Catholic idea too, of using Rome as that example. Um, in the past and the future, sort of identically. Quietly did the same. Um, so moving on to the last stanza, but differed in returning. So there's a there's sort of a, and I like this because it's sort of Christmas themed, differed in returning, there's a return, like a, a resurrection, since Yorkshire hills are green. So greenness, hope, that's a, the, that is the color of the theological virtue, hope. Um, and hope is that which returns, like the spring, every... Uh, ever again from a time of desolation, yet not in all the nests I meet can Nightingale be seen. So something has returned, but something's different and something seems to be gone forever, something very unique. And so it, just given the context, it seems as if at, at a whole, she is suggesting that something so unique and beyond the care of the, or beyond the understanding of this world, uh, though, though things are, are returning that are beautiful and wonderful, the most unique thing, something something that cannot be replaced, something that's irreplaceable, will never come back. Um, yeah, that's I what. Will. Yeah. Well, go ahead. No, that's what I've got. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I. I mean, I think there's something to the um, the mythic kind of opening out of the poem at the end. It doesn't look like there's an end punctuation. It's just that last dash. Ah, yes. And, and the nightingale, right? Yeah, it, it does have tons of romantic and mythological resonance. So there's that kind of illusion happening, but there's also these more particular allusions to um, Kerr Bell and Haworth. So like this specific person that she's writing about, um, referring to her by her, her pen name, right the name that she took on as a as an author and for those reasons you described right that she was um not going to be taken seriously as a female author a novelist and so she had this other pseudonym um and what's going on there in the in the final stanzas seems to be yeah that she is brought back to her home or something like that um and the way in which among other um, like great authors, you know, or other poets that or and writers that Dickinson might admire, um, that she doesn't find anyone quite like Charlotte Bronte. Um, is it seems like you know very high praise, very elegiac in that way. Like this this unique sort of bird, right? Um, has has disappeared, is gone, and and she in in some way I think must also be alluding to the um the idea that you can still hear the music of the bird even if you don't see it you know so like yeah she's she's gone like her life has ended in one sense but her poetry lives on and her music is still there so though you don't see the the nightingale you hear its song right and, and so i think she's also like celebrating that in a way um so on the one hand mourning but on the other hand um celebrating and, and you know promoting even like saying hey this is like worth this kind of writing and this poetry and and this literature this whole world of of literature by women is is worth um listening to even if you can't you know you, you aren't really able to see it yet um or anymore or whatever the case might be yeah so she's also 
Dickinson's life, you know, is very interestingly kind of reflected in her poetry. She's, you know, a bit of a recluse, it seems like. And, you know, her concerns and her, her biographical experiences um, are, you know, people who read a lot of her, apparently like the, uh, the editors of the Poetry Foundation site, can seem, seem to see a lot um, reflected in her poetry. And what's, what's interesting, too, is, well, one thing that they mention is that she might not have been as reclusive as we used to think because of some letters that they've been reading uh, that she sent between people. It seems as if she might have had a pretty good social life, though she was very much ambivalent about publishing. And there's some theory that uh, one, of her, one of her very early poems received sort of very firm criticism from somebody she respected who she asked for the opinion of very straightly and that that might have hurt her relationship to publishing uh, for her life. And so I thought that was interesting. And it's sort of interesting just how the perceptions of a poet evolve over time with emerging scholarship and documentation, but also that uh, something we were talking about in the pre-show and something we talked about last time is uh, fidelity of the poem and how it's transmitted to us on Poetry Foundation. Is this the original? What did it look like? And something interesting about Emily Dickinson is she apparently had very interesting spelling and punctuation that by many of her editors was corrected because it was seen as sort of juvenile mistake <coughs> rather, rather than uh, poetic mastery. And so there seem to be parts of the text that have been corrupted or changed over time because of the opinions and thoughts of others. And that does seem to be part of how, uh, how the pattern of poetry or of song or the perception of an author changes. And, you know, there are two schools of thought on this. Of course, the, the purest school of thought that, that ruin, that's corruption and that ruins everything. And you find that in, you know, literary documentation circles as well as religions. Um, <clears throat> but then you find sort of the more fluid Catholic perception, which is, that a, a poem or a, the, the idea of a poet evolves correctly over time. And <coughs> what we don't need from them or what doesn't fit the narrative or the niche that they occupied sort of dies away and we, keep, we sort of keep what's most relevant. And I, I, I don't necessarily more agree with one per, uh, school of thought or the other, but more see them both as helpful tools of analysis. But I, I think that is interesting to note here that like you said it what we are reading is very close to the original it is the closest version at least poetry foundation says that but it's a uh, i think a harvard press yes it's a harvard university press we see it down there the reading edition <coughs> but um it's not perfect uh the other thing i was going to say just very quickly is that i now see the first stanza as just a physical metaphor it does seem to be describing a a coffin going into the ground uh, and a graveyard. Um, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that that, that location, the, like for the Bronte's writing, um, the Moors, you know, it's become sort of iconic. And, um, and so that the, the body of the writer is then laid there, I think sort of is a kind of picture of, of this process we're describing of like how the writer's life and their time, their history, their biography, sort of informs and is reflected by their writing, um, is contained within it in a sense, but that what's living about it, the writing itself grows and is not bound by that and changes with the experience of each new reader and the whole tradition of scholarship and audience that, that um, accesses it over time. And yeah, I mean, it's like, it's very, very interesting how, um, you know, one little image there can sort of explode with meaning once you um, start to dig in and sort of see, okay, so what is, she clearly is like referring to stuff here. So we've got to, got to kind of dig into that and, to, and figure out what that is. All of that is, is super interesting. And then you come back and maybe ultimately just to the, the sound of the poem itself, like the sound of the syllables, the, the music of her, um, her grief and her aspirations, these, these rhymes which are close to being rhymes, but don't quite rhyme that she does a lot of, you notice, um, like weed and laid. Mm. They're, they're, they're like a slant rhyme, I think is the term for yes. it. And so it's like, you just kind of have this, this slight dissonance almost um, uh, within the song, within the music that, um, that sort of hauntingly just like trails off at the end. I just think it's a, it's a really powerful little poem. 
And I think that's another difference between the first poem, the first stanza and well, the last two, because when you noted that, I looked at the next two stanzas and in the, uh, the second and fourth lines, we do have a rhyme, became and same and green and seen. And so right. just as there are the dashes in the, the second two and the second two don't seem to be like, they are both clearly metaphorical uh, or more metaphorical more fe metaphorical, less physically metaphorical than the first stanza. The first stanza is clearly a metaphor for a physical metaphor conveying the image of a coffin going into the ground. But then the second one starts with this bird, and it's obviously not a regular bird, even though the image is a bird um, uh, on a peak looking uh, or flying away now uh, from frost, flying south for the winter, flying to the heavenly isles or the, you know, the western isles, the, the place of warmth. Um, and then, then you, again, you have a physical image that's also clearly uh, just a meta, but a metaphor for something else, a symbol for something else, the returning green. Um, but, but I do have this question, what does it mean when the frosts were too sharp and retired to other latitudes? How did Charlotte Bronte die? Okay, yeah, so I was looking up her Wikipedia real quick. Um, there's this section on death. Uh, so she, um, she actually gets married. Um, it sounds like her siblings actually die very young as well. And so she, um, shortly after she's married, um, becomes pregnant, but then dies before giving birth. Uh, dies from, sounds like at the time they said it was dehydration, or sorry, um, tuberculosis. Other studies suggest dehydration and malnourishment caused by severe morning sickness. There's even evidence that she might have died from typhus, possibly caught from a servant who had it and died of it shortly before. So there's a lot of possible causes of death, but then it does mention that she's buried in the family vault um, at Haworth or Haworth or how you say that. So she's got some um, recently, uh, as recently as, um, 20, uh, 2003, there was a, a posthumous version of an unfinished novel uh, released by um, a, a scholar, it looks like, uh, Claire Boylan. Um, so she like had other things written, you know, she died very young, like a lot of these <laughs> great writers did, I suppose. Um, so. Well, it might be interesting at some point to do a course with you of posthumously published slash unfinished works of English, of great English authors with you. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a rich literature, that's for sure. That's for uh, sure, that's for sure. And I'm feeling very much enriched by this. I've been lecturing all day today, all day yesterday, a good bit of the day tomorrow. It's a good way to end the semester. You know, you gotta stay sharp and you gotta, keep embodying this stuff to keep it alive. Um, we would only have like three minutes. Do you want to see if the next poem is one stanza long? <laughs> Let's, here's what I think we should do. Okay. So I think we should just read, but not comment on the poem that she supposedly requested read for her funeral, which is a poem by Emily Bronte. Okay. Um, I, I Googled that and there's a version of it on the Guardian online. Um, so maybe, do you want to read it or shall I just read it? Here, let's see how fast I can get it here. Uh, the Strange right. Cult of Emily Bronte, Hot Mess. Is that the one? The one I found is a poem of the week, No Coward Soul is Mine by Emily Bronte. Okay, okay, I'll add that in. No cowards. Got it. <clears throat> So there's a paragraph there that says, it's said that Emily Dickinson chose this poem to be read at her funeral. Um, the two Emilies had a good deal in common, their solitude and independence, their hymn-like meters, the crystalline directness of their language, the art of thinking big on a miniature scale. So this is all, it's all very uh, enticing. So I'm gonna just, or do you want, oh, yeah, you read it, you read it. The poem starts a little below that, No Coward Soul is Mine. Got it. No Coward Soul is Mine. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world's storm-troubled sphere. I see heaven's glories shine, and faith shines equal, arming me from fear. O oh God within my breast, almighty ever-present deity, life that in me hast rest, as I undying life have power in thee. 
Vain are the thousand creeds that move men's hearts unutterably vain, worthless as withered weeds, or idless froth amid the boundless main. To waken doubt in one holding so fast by thine infinity, so surely anchored on the steadfast rock of immortality. With wide embracing love, thy spirit animates eternal years, pervades and broods above, changes, sustains, dissolves, creates, and rears. Though earth and moon were gone, and suns and universes ceased, ceased to be, and thou wert left alone, every existence would exist in thee. There is not room for death, nor atom that his might could render void. Thou, thou art being and breath. What thou art may never be destroyed. Well, until next time. <laughs> Mr. Wesley Chance just to leave people in suspense. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good place to pick up for next time then. Well, thanks sounds, again. Sounds very good. All right. Well, I'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, tra thank you for making the time today. Of course. My pleasure. Later. All right. Later. <laughs>